Ragnar, poetry is a physical act. We are looking forward to hearing more about this. I'm Greg Berry, Assistant Director in the Office of Alumni Affairs here at UAB. Just a quick note, since we're virtual, don't be surprised if things may seem out of place or a technical issue pops up. If you experience any issues with your video or audio, please click the reconnect button at the top of your screen. This will get you back to the webinar right away. Tonight's webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded onto our website tomorrow. Also, I wanted to let the audience know that a part of tonight's presentation will discuss censorship due to the sensitive nature of material that will be shared. It may not be appropriate for younger ears. So if somebody is younger in the room with you, you may want to scurry them into the next room for this webinar. If you do have questions throughout the evening, please place them in the chat room. We'll have time for a Q&A at the end of tonight's presentation. So at this time, Chris, I would like to formally introduce you. Chris Pappas is a 2002 graduate of the UAB College of Arts and Sciences, where he double majored in English and philosophy. In 2007, he earned a Master of Fine Arts and Poetry from the University of Arkansas. He's the co-founder of the U.S. Poetry Company and Us Poco Books. He frequently travels the country to engage the average person about poetry by distributing books and magazines of poetry. And again, for those just joining us, because I know some have trickled in, the sensitive nature of some of the material that we will be sharing tonight may not be appropriate for a younger audience. So at that this point of the evening, Chris, welcome. Thank you so much for being here, and the platform is yours. Awesome. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you, AB Alumni Society, for letting me do this. And I'd like to thank you, Greg. You are a magician of a producer, and you helped me get all these files ready. Thank you so much. I'm yeah, super yeah. excited. Uh, that last picture of me juggling, that's uh, what I looked like um, when I was at UAB 20 years ago. And now my daughter Allie is at UAB and she'll be 20 uh, one week from today. So happy birthday, Allie. Um, this is not my ideal uh, setting. Um, I'm a person who loves to teach or perform in front of a live audience. And when I signed up, I thought, I would be able to interact with you guys in the audience. And so it kind of threw me for a loop. And so um, I decided to bring my own audience. Okay, it's nice to see a lot of familiar faces there. I'm glad those guys could come with me, blast from the past. Um, I, uh, in, the, in the description of this talk, sorry, I'm having to negotiate these slides, so give me a minute. In the description of this talk, um, I mentioned seven ways of seeing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and put those up on the screen and we'll be uh, going back and forth between those tonight. Tonight, I'm going to read some poetry. Uh, we're going to just talk about poetry. I don't know exactly what I'm going to say. I never do. Uh, I take a lot of notes, but if I refer to them, it means I'm lost. So 
Um, I'm going to start off by putting these up just so you can get an idea of what those seven ways of seeing are. <coughs> these are um, seven, the seven ways of seeing were passed down to me from a friend, Jack Taylor, and a mentor. Um, and he applied these to life, and I found a way to apply them to poetry. Uh, this, and similar in a way to Aristotle's three appeals of argument, um, the more of these that you can connect with as a reader or writer of poetry, I feel like the best, the uh, more likely you'll have of making a kind of essential human connection that only poetry can do. I hope to demonstrate that uh, through the course of the night. I have to say, uh, running these down, they are in a specific order. Um, the idea of kinesthetic appeals or kinesthetic ability is my own uh, kind of special sense of the word. I'm sure it's far off from any scientific meaning. Um, I, that I had a picture of me juggling at the beginning. <clears throat> I've been juggling my whole life. It's a kind of magic and meditation. Uh, when you let go of one ball uh, in your right hand, the left hand knows where it's going to land automatically. You don't need your eyes to get there. You have kind of intuitive eyes or an intuitive sense that connects to the outer world. And I'm going to apply that to poetry, if that makes sense. It's kind of poetry's magic. Um, and the next one, physical, those are the main two I'll be talking about. Um, the rest of these, I think you'll be able to see um, how aspects of a, of a poem appeal to your emotional, mental, intellectual, psychological, and eventually spiritual sense. After all, it's a transformation from the physical poem to the spirit of human being. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the physical sense because if I could only tell students or people who hated poetry, one thing that's important about poetry is that you have to read a poem out loud. Um, if it doesn't pass over your lips, you're not reading poetry. Um, to kind of uh, back me up on this, I want to play a little clip from an interview with Maya Angelou. When she was a child, um, a traumatic event happened to her and she reported something and a person got killed uh, because of it. And so she realized that her words had the power to kill. And so she didn't speak for about six years. And in this video, in this interview with Diane Rehm, she describes um, how poetry brought her back to speaking. So wise. She, she was the daughter of a former slave. How did this woman, did this woman know, so, know much? so much? She was just, she was just wise. wise. She was wisdom she was itself. Wisdom itself. And, and Maya, what, what was it was that it finally, finally broke, broke your son? Well, it was poetry, well, it was poetry really. Really. There was a woman, was a woman in our, in our, town, in our black, lady, black lady who, who took, took me to the me black to the school. school. She knew she knew I wasn't going to, wasn't talk. Going to talk, but she said but I want, she you, said to I want you to read book every book in this library. In this library. So I read so every book. I didn't know what I was reading most of the time, most but, I read. but I read. And I found and I I found loved poetry. poetry. I could almost hear it. And I would write it down. I would write it down. Finally, one day, I was 12. And she, and, and she invited me invited to her me house, to her and she house. used to read, used to, me. read to me. And I would, and I would she invite, said, you know something, you know something Maya, you don't, Maya, you don't poetry. poetry. So I had a little so tablet, a tablet, tablet my grandmother had given me. I wrote, yes, ma'am, and tried to give her the tablet. She said, no, no, you don't love it. You will never love it until you speak it. Feel it come across your tongue, over your lips. You'll never love poetry. I ran from her. I ran out of her house. She followed me. She harassed me for months. And finally, I went under the house, under my grandmother's store, which was built on stilts. And the dirt under the store was soft like powder because of chickens. And I went under the house with Bailey. And I realized I had left my voice. My voice had not left me. And I started speaking. I admit slowly at first. I didn't trust, trust it at first. At
Okay, it's giving me a minute to figure this whole deal out. So sorry if there was any back there. I hope you can all hear me now. Um, some of the first poems uh, were the primary epics from Homer and then Beowulf that were essentially songs. Um, they were songs that were sung in families and tribes that were passed down from parents to their children. And the songs um, depicted the heroic deeds of men. Uh, and those deeds were designed to teach people in a society the values of that society. Uh, we all know the magic of song. Um, I think if you think about songs that you've heard, it's easier to see how these seven ways of seeing. You think about when you hear a song you haven't heard in 20 years and you still know the words to it. What is that? It's magic. Um, you know, the kinesthetic part, nobody has to analyze a song for you, right? You just start tapping your feet, you start moving along, you don't convince yourself to enjoy a song. And it's the same way with poetry. It's the same way with a joke. Um, it's a spontaneous response. And it's hard to get a spontaneous response if you're just passing your eyes over the words of a poem. And that's how a lot of people read poetry. We stare at it, we, we read it and we hear it in our head, but there's not, the only kind of transaction that can happen in that is the kind of transaction most people uh, talk about in poetry workshops, which I'm gonna discuss later. And it's a kind of transaction from the poet through the poem to the reader. And it's usually a transaction of meaning or narrative or experience. But when you read a poem out loud, and especially in public, or even more so with a group of people, the transaction that's happening that's essential is from the poem to you to the world. And that transaction happens in breath. Uh, and from there, magic can happen. <clears throat> Since 2007, I've been traveling the country and doing these, uh, what I call pop-up readings on a milk crate. I still have the same orange milk crate. I've had it all these years. And every class of mine that has anything to do with poetry, everybody, we have a poetry day. And all the students uh, get up on the milk crate and read a poem. It could be their poem or a poem they like. And <clears throat> the reason that I stand on a milk crate is to make a spectacle of myself, um, to attract people so they can hear when that transaction happens from, from the poem to me out into the, into the wind, into the world. Um, an example of this is in 2007 um, with uh, Lisa Scroggins, published this was our first magazine. Uh, this is the last uh, remaining issue that I have of this magazine. And uh, we took a van load of poets uh, from Fayetteville, Arkansas, piled up in a van and went to Atlanta to launch the magazine uh, at the AWP meeting in 2007. I was originally signed up for a table in the book fair. It was $600 for that table. I didn't really have the money for any of it. So I was like, why would I pay $600 to go be right up midst my competition? And so we took that money and that's how we got the van and the, we all stayed in one hotel room. And when we got there, there was some construction in front of the hotel with a jackhammer. And uh, I mean, there was no way you could hear poetry over that jackhammer. And I said, this is the perfect spot. We're going to stand right here in front of this jackhammer because this is a poetry demonstration. You know, it's symbolic that poetry is trying to put its voice right here with all the other noise of the world. Um, cars drove by and honked the horn and only a small group of people gathered. But from that five minute reading, essentially, um, several connections were made that just, that kept, continued to build over the weekend. And from those connections, um, about a third or more of this issue of the magazine, uh, those people ended up being published in here. Um, and this is the kind of living connection that I value in poetry. Um, to speak it aloud in front of a crowd in these readings as I travel um, <clears throat> uh, in, in U.S. Poetry Company, which was started in 2009 with Rebecca Savitz in Us Poco Books in 2010. 
We traveled the country, go to the local bookstore. <clears throat> Pardon my voice. Aha. And I would buy a few books <clears throat> that lent themselves well to reading. Stand on the milk crate, read as loud as I can, get attention, a crowd gathers. And if I see a person getting into that book, then I throw the book to them afterward. You know, and that, that's essentially what we traveled around and did. And then a few people would stick around and talk about poetry afterward. And that was the only goal was to attract people to poetry. Um, I talked about the original poems being the uh, epics. Um, and when Socrates had a problem uh, with the invention of writing, he thought it would make us um, dumber. He thought it would make us intellectually lazy and we would lose our ability to think as well. And he believed that knowledge could only be passed directly from person to person. Uh, and that's the spirit that I uh, do these readings in that we do us poetry company uh, and and i like to say anybody who's ever who we've ever made anything with is a member of us poetry company um, what i'd like to do uh, in the poems we look at tonight is look at where that kind of oral epic tradition is still floating around in contemporary poetry and i'm going to start off <clears throat> by reading some of night cradle um, by Cy Holwa, a great poetry brother of mine I met in grad school. And these poems, um, hold on, let me put up a slide up. Uh, many of these poems were reprinted in the recent New Poets of Native Nations anthology, um, but from Grey Wolf, I believe, uh, as you see here. And I'm just going to read a few of these. I don't know how many. Um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Uh, and then on the, on the other side, you'll see um, Sai's latest book, Ancestral Demon of a Grieving Bride, which he was so gracious to give me a copy, and it's wonderful. Um, Sai, in my estimation, um, is one of the most talented living poets in America. <laughs> I believe Sai is here listening tonight. Uh, and so when I read this, um, he wouldn't recognize me in this mask. So I'm going to um, let this guy read it. Uh, the book is called Night Cradle, and it's um, 13 kind of linked poems. None of the individual poems are titled. And so I'm going to read through uh, three or four of them. I hope I can uh, do them justice. <clears throat> I slept beside Blank's grave until I dreamed. When I woke up, a fox had my skull on top of his head, praying to the Big Dipper. The fox looked like a grown person in the face. In a greasy voice, it called me tall meat. When I was the bones, carried the saga of the woods in my overalls. I wrote on the pine needles with pine needles, a line about the life of what was in the way. My guardian angel stirred the campfire with a straightened out wire coat hanger. Moonlit drops shaken off the angel's $20 bill when snakes licked my ears. I gained prophetic knowledge. I threw my knife from the previous life it still rings from the hilltop covered in clouds. My discarded clothes had their own hands and feet and gathered at the fence row, passed themselves off as the stranded needing a ride into town. I dug a hole into the ground, escaping marriage to the elk's scraped moon. Sorry for that delay. Toward Mount Scott, it is sharp as a knife. The bad roads lead to lost roads. The lost roads lead to the same empty spot. People sometimes go to lonely places for power. Eagles are sometimes choked. Dragonflies lassoed. Smaller birds follow ghosts to eat off the bugs. 
line of barbed wire marks the boundary between this world and the next. Ever since I can remember, the decapitated head sings about being in a brass bucket at the foot of a cold mountain. Then it chases us, lightning tied to its hair, jagged teeth glow, voice sharpened on the stones swallowed. Speed up, slow down, a vengeance, old tribal times. Lightning has no sympathy for anyone. Lightning struck the eye of the neighbor's dog while it drank hail water. Lightning also likes to look into mirrors. A woman feathering her hair was struck in the mouth and killed. However, my mother's cousin was best friends with Lightning. She married Lightning. Every time a storm approached, sparks flew from her armpits. My Siamese twin is a boring partner who insists on helmets. I want to go to Memphis. He wants to go to Wind River. We set out on a bicycle with a banana seat. We listen for stray dogs, warm rain, and for the corpse wandering the countryside who is not ashamed to laugh with someone else's blood on its teeth. So focused on listening, we pedal out to where moonlight breaks like a knife blade on the silence. I'm just gonna keep going, I can't stop. When I wear my dress shoes, I find myself wandering aimlessly like a dream going into the trees, or my shoes lead me into perilous situations. Once I woke up on the highest point of the shakiest rooftop, so close to bumping into the dead, flower petals fell into my eyes when their mouths opened to receive the stars. What is left of my family's 160 acres, a lone pecan tree on the fringe of Cache Creek. A squirrel runs up and down the trunk carrying insults between my dead grandfather and the birds that live in the top branches. I carved my name on the moon's teeth. When the ice is heavy on the wings and it's easier to tear the moonlight out of the trees, I, I signal the number of fatalities by raising and lowering my black blanket. My skin hardened and forged fire. My genitals shine like, an, like a Ulysses S. Grant peace medal. Since I can't leave this ghost town, my job is to blacken things that need blackened. Gun holsters, undertaker's teeth, church bells, apple on the schoolmaster's desk. The orchards have been long gone. Disappointment is the best adventure, exclaims the town's oldest prostitute. Out of the lake, we caught a catfish, kept it, starved it for days. The fish began speaking like a human, foretold our futures, how death's mustache is a soft thing, like a kitten or a wad of cotton. And for days, we looked in that fish for the luck bone, catfish's constant smile, moved like a snake in the water. Before we are eaten, the raccoon witch cannibal monk sings to us, showing rolls upon rolls of teeth the songs are always about the Arapaho girl whose parents' names are white, crazy, and Greek, and how she offers her last finger as a sacrifice. Then the cannibal monk takes a bow, wearing his own gigantic scrotum as a robe. <coughs> At the center of the center of the center of things, he keeps us. His stomach is a small bedroom with an old mattress and wooden floor lined with old newspapers and coffee cans full of kerosene for the scorpions that come out to mock. Night barely fits my house. Her legs lie in one corner, an arm in, it, in another, her head underneath the bed. I lost a tooth in the hair around Night's nipple. Her nose grows into the ceiling Height of the ceiling devours the lamplight. No distinction between the ceiling and the hard surface of the other world's howl.
913, the sun slowly crosses the hair on the eyepiece of the dead mother coming down, looking around for her children. Horses expand and contract across a hilltop and empty out into a valley singed in the grease of strength. A hornet drifts into a deserted house around the waste of silence. Underneath the porch, butterfly wings melt in cat saliva. I keep knocking my face on the sunlight. Wow. Okay, well, I was only going to read a few of those, but I couldn't stop. That's exactly the point. Um, those poems pulled me through and I feel energized. I wish I could see you guys. I can hear you. I can feel you gasping and clapping, I hope. Um, this book is still, this book came out in 2011 and it still sells and it's still available. Look it up on Amazon if you want to get a copy. Um, keeping in that tradition of the epic poems that pass down the values of a society. Um, I think that Sai is doing that here. Um, in his poetry, he is trying to depict the oral tradition, tradition that he was raised with what I've heard him call Indian way. Um, a lot of the youth don't have those uh, elders anymore to tell these stories. And Sai is a great storyteller. And thank goodness he's chosen to preserve that culture and poetry. And now the job is to make a spectacle of ourselves and get the youth to listen. Um, I'm gonna put on another kind of video here from a guy that Sai and I, and all of us, but Sai and I especially discovered in grad school, Ed Sanders, uh, who I've been fortunate enough to work with several times um, and publish his poetry. I'm gonna, uh, he's gonna be talking, giving reasons again for why the performance of poetry is so essential and that is a throwback to the ancient times. So check this out. Ed Sanders. The old Ezra Pound triad, you know, there's Phanopia, Melopia, and Logopia. And uh, Phanopia is the way it looks on the page. And I bring hieroglyphs to that and drawings and stuff. And Melopia is how it sounds. And Melopia is where the muse comes in. I think there has to be an, uh, another muse invented for the electromagnetic era, which can I call retentia for the retained image on tape or on film or on micro disc or whatever. And uh, I, I just think it's important to uh, be able to perform your poets, poetry well as well as for it to look good on the page, which is fanopia, and for it to appear well in the mind, which is logopia. <laughs> That's called the talking tie. It just goes back to performing. In ancient times, they had a little uh, four or seven string a tortoise shell lyre with a, with a tortoise shell as the sounding board and little uh, uh, cow horn or a wooden uh, 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 arms and then a crossbar for the strings. And the poet would sit there with a plectrum or, or something to strum his keys, uh, the strings, and would perform his poetry. And it was this hypnotic. Uh, riverine type of verse that people would listen to for hours and hours. These dactyls, da 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 da, you know, and they would listen to it over and over. And I was interested in uh, kind of building a modern instrument, electronic instrument that was small and wouldn't overwhelm the poetry. So I invented, I got these little tune synthesizers, two of them, one for each hand with the keyboards on the fingers. The genius was 81. Fearful of blindness, caught in a wheelchair, staring at death. But the angel of mercy uh, gave him a year to scissor some shapes to soothe the scythe. One must study an object a long time, the genius said, to know what its sign is. The scissors were his scepter, 
and the cutting was as the prow of a boat to sail him away, to sail him away. Okay, as you can see, I put a uh, size name and books back up there. For people chatting, I can't see those chats in real time because um, I'm using this panel to run the slides and videos. So bear with me and I'll get to any questions uh, later, or I may take a break in the middle and answer some questions. Uh, but I did see that one that someone asked again for size name. And so I put this up here so you can write it down and get his new book. All right, uh, next, I want to transition to another kind of um, origin myth. Um, bear with me. We're going to look at uh, uh, we're going to talk about Eve, uh, what she represents historically. Um, and I want to start off uh, with what John Milton uh, says about her. <clears throat> when I, I need to interject something here that I haven't said yet. Um, when I was, my whole life until I was about 27 or 28, I never read poetry. I did when I was a child. I read poetry and wrote poems. And I feel like that's how we should approach poetry is with the playful mind of a child rather than with the serious mind of balancing a checkbook or solving a math problem. Because poetry, like life, uh, is not a problem to be solved. It's a reality to experience and put out there. And so, you know, I hated poetry. Um, and I'm going to get into later what, what changed that because we're going to look at the poem that did it. Um, but the point is, is that when I did start getting into poetry, uh, miraculously, and I went to bookstores, I would see John Milton's Paradise Lost. We share a birthday, by the way, December 9th. Um, I turned 40 on the day Milton turned 400. So I like that. I'm proud of that. Uh, when I would see Paradise Lost, it looked like the Bible. You know, it was so thick and I would flip through it. And I never dreamed in a million years that I would ever read that, much less decide that it's the greatest poem in the English language, which it is. Um, thanks to Dr. Allison Chapman who had just come to UAB from Tulane uh, my first year. And I took her Milton class. If you get it, if she's still teaching it and you can take it, beat down the doors to get in there. I learned more about poetry in that class than perhaps any other class. Um, and the fire that she uh, stirred in me has never stopped for Milton. And I teach Milton and I try to get Milton in front of people as much as possible. And you can see, by this language on the screen, why people resist, resist it, you know, it's like Shakespeare, but harder. Um, and this little passage, uh, so what Paradise Lost is, is a kind of retelling of the Garden of Eden story, um, the origin story of human being, as I call it. And uh, Milton uh, always wanted to write an epic, by the way. And he, he wanted to write an Arthurian epic, um, and he worked on that for many years. And when he did eventually write Paradise Lost, I think in his 30s, he was completely blind uh, and under house arrest for um, contributing to the overthrowing of a king. He was Oliver Cromwell's um, Latin secretary. Um, and so eventually he shifted as he, he was a Puritan Christian um, and he shifted and decided to write a Christian epic. Uh, and in his opening, he says symbolically that it's going to soar above the classic epics. And he chose, he chose this subject matter for that reason. Uh, so here, these quotes are in book nine. And I couldn't put everything up. I would like to if we had more time. But at this point in the epic, um, the angels had been... Uh, Satan was kind of depicted as a rebel and as a kind of pioneer, and he was out to discover this new world and destroy these new people who were going to get the free will that the angels never had. Um, and 
uh, Michael was meeting with Adam and Eve and guiding them. And by the way, uh, Milton believed that, that conversation could really only happen between two people. Um, and Eve was never part of that conversation. Uh, when, when Michael would sit down, if it was the three of them, it was him and Adam. And Eve would kind of saunter off um, into the periphery. And she always received her uh, version of everything from Adam. Uh, I love the part in, in her origin story when she's first uh, made and she spots her reflection in the water and kind of, you know, loves the image there. Um, and she, uh, an angel says, no, uh, we have somebody for you. He's over here, come over here. When she first saw him, she was like, ah! And she took off running back to look at herself in the water. Um, and at this point in book nine, the angels had warned, <clears throat> excuse me, The angels had warned them that this guy was coming after them, and they basically said, stay together. You know, don't do anything stupid. Well, Eve goes to Adam and makes these three arguments for why they should work apart. And, and in, in the passage depicted here and in the arguments that aren't depicted here, she was assertive and perfectly rational. And because of that, as a woman, uh, people believe that she was already in a fallen state. Uh, because her place wasn't to be assertive or rational. It was to rely on her man, uh, which, what you know, as you know, is the tradition of the times. And so as she makes these arguments, and they are essentially, one, we can get more work done if we work apart. Two, if we spend some time away from each other, we'll enjoy our time together. I get that. And three was that <clears throat> if, if this uh, uh, villain has any nobility about him, he won't, he won't get any honor by attacking me, the weaker sex. So with some um, regret, Adam eventually agrees and uh, sh she goes off by herself. So this first paragraph that I'll read, or this first verse starting at uh, line 335 in book nine of Paradise Lost, uh, Dartmouth has a great version of Paradise Lost for free. If you haven't read it and you want to check it out, it's annotated and, and it's got hyperlinks to explain everything. And that's what this one's from. <clears throat> and this is her response to um, Adam's foreboding that she shouldn't go. And she says, and I remember um, Dr. Chapman showing me how Milton's verse worked because uh, we had to write a prosody paper analyzing um, arguments that are that are made in the uh, alteration of the meter, um, which is blank verse iambic, uh, unrhymed iambic pentameter. Um, and, and in this line, and what is faith, love, virtue, unassayed, you get those three stresses together. And she taught me how to look for that and that the poet's trying to um, get our attention here. And what is faith, love, virtue, unassayed, alone, without exterior help sustained? Let us not then suspect our happy state, left so imperfect by the maker wise as not secure to single or combined. Frail is our happiness if this be so, and Eden were no Eden thus exposed. And so she makes her argument, and then a few lines later, we see a uh, Satan kind of flying down and he's looking. He doesn't expect them to be apart because he thinks they're not that stupid, um, but he's, he's overjoyed to find her alone. Um, and that's what this depicts. And you'll see, um, it, well, I'll read it first. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice here. He sought them both, but wished his hat might find Eve separate. He wished, but not with hope, of what so seldom chanced when to his wish beyond his hope. Eve separate he spies, veiled in a cloud of fragrance where she stood, half spied, so thick the roses bushing around about her glowed, oft stooping to support each flower of slender stalk, whose head, though gay carnation, purple, azure, or specked with gold, hung drooping unsustained, 
Then she upstays, gently with myrtle band, mindless the while, herself, though fairest, unsupported flower, from her best prop so far, and storm so nigh. And you can see that Eve is depicted by herself as a flower without a prop that without her man, she would droop and eventually die. And so the next um, contemporary poet I'd like to look at uh, to kind of answer that, sorry, let me get back here, is uh, Sarah Janine Smith. And uh, this is a book of hers that we published in 2019. A uh, wonderful uh, chapbook with 18 poems in it. Um, and But the poem I want to read is a newer poem of hers that has been published that I can't remember where. It's not in the chat book, but it's called Eve. And what Sarah has done is taken kind of the most universal origin story. Uh, when you're writing a poem and, and you do this, in my mind, poetry uh, is like a hose. If you pick something that everyone knows, then you can use the force of that knowing uh, to like a mist to spray or net in a large group of people. And that's what Sarah has done here brilliantly. Um, she doesn't have to establish the parameters of this myth. Everybody knows it. It's part of our received knowledge, you know, in society. And so um, her poem kind of turns the story we just saw about Milton being, I mean, I'm sorry, about Eve being an unpropped flower without her man and turns it on its ear. Um, so <clears throat> when before I knew I wasn't going to have access to you guys, I was hoping we could do some group reading. Um, and I'll stop real quick to say this. So there's a few ways that we, in, we engage poetry. And the first way was that I said most of us read poems by just passing our eyes over the word and we hear it in our head. And then the next way is to read it out loud, as Maya Angelou, uh, her aunt, or whoever that was, said, if the poetry is not passing through your tongue and over your lips, you can never love poetry. So in reading it out loud, we're giving ourselves over to the poem, because uh, if the poem is crafted well, I call this a poem as sheet music. Um, it's just a, a system of cues to prompt the reader to say certain things in a certain way. And there's a lots of ways to do that. And in doing that, your breath can be regulated and you could be put in a kind of trance state or meditative state, or you could even be uttering spells. Um, so to give yourself over to a poem could be a risky thing. And with risky things come much payoff. So I'm gonna put her poem up here, what I was saying. And then the other ways uh, are to read a poem in front of a crowd, and that's where the kinesthetic aspect of reading comes in. Anybody who's ever performed in front of an audience, especially if you don't haven't memorized your poem, knows that you're looking at the poem, you're looking at the audience, right? You're aware of yourself, you're aware of your surroundings, and if you're going to pull that reading off well, you go into a different place, and that's what I call that kind of kinesthetic, intuitive knowledge or magic. Um, and, and, and then the other thing, which is the greatest, is to read a poem with a large group of people where you're all reading it. This is what I do in my classes, and this is what I wanted to do tonight. So we're still going to do that. I'm going to challenge you to, except I'm not going to be able to hear you. And so I would like, for one, I'll challenge you for every poem you ever read from this point on, read it out loud. Um, and so we're going to start with this poem. I'm going to read it. And I'd like for you to read it uh, to yourself there with me. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. This includes uh, everyone. <coughs> okay. So here we go. Get ready. And the way I do this in class is um, I'm kind of the through line. So I'll establish this poem is kind of short. So it's harder to get that uh, through line established. And then once I establish that rhythm and it's predictable, then join in and read a line or a word or the whole thing, okay? So here we go, Eve. I am a beautiful bone cracked off your cage, wrangled out of your viscera. I am a salvaged appendage, art from found object, 
a gore-streaked crutch for you to lean on, a satiating afterthought to soothe the wound I made in your flesh. Just like I ran with that rib, I will believe and repeat every story I am told. Some stories will grow skin and call me mother. Others will devour me and call me whore. I am so pretty, it is scary. I am so gentle, it hurts. Who could predict the havoc I will wreak so wryly, a smile coiling into my red lips. Soon you will see me saunter out of this ruined garden, juice leaking from my mouth. You will be right behind me. I will throw you back that bone I took from you. I love that poem. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. What, bear me with me one second. Okay. Um, for a minute, I'd like to talk about, I said in the description that I was going to talk about the way that poetry has evolved over, or the role of the poetry and the poets has evolved over the last several decades. Um, and this is an idea, as everybody knows, <laughs> that I've been obsessed with and tinkering with since for 15 years or more. Um, and it's the idea, um, if, if you've ever taken a uh, science class, you may have heard of Thomas Kuhn's book, um, uh, oh, the title just went out of my head, A Theory of Scientific Revolutions, I think. And he discusses how scientific paradigms shift. Um, so uh, an example would be from Newtonian physics to Einstein's uh, theories of relativity. Um, a theory is accepted by the community and experiments are done to test that theory. And at some point, anomalies occur, things that can't be reconciled with the theory. And eventually those tend to increase until it's obvious the paradigm is no longer suited. And, and this is a violent time within that period when the paradigm is shifting until a new one is established. You've probably heard of a lot of um, poetry movements like confessionalism, realism, imagism, romanticism. Most of these movements are in some way a reaction to a previous movement. Um, and the movement that I believe we've been in probably since the 60s, but primarily um, from the 80s forward is what I call the MFA school. Uh, another guy's called it the program era. And I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right now. Um, and so I want to just put up a little uh, chart of statistics here. And this is from the AWP uh, thing. And it shows the increase from 1975 to 2015 in the number of degree granting creative writing programs. And so as you'll see, and you can see them broken down um, into the different ones, uh, MFAs, Master of Fine Arts. Uh, and so in 1975, there were a total of 79 degree uh, granting creative writing programs. And in 2015, there was 1,766. Well, where are all these people going? Because pretty much the only thing you can do, getting a degree in poetry doesn't make you a better writer. You could argue it makes you a worse writer. I'm not going to make that argument. Um, but it doesn't make you a better writer. So all it does is make you a teacher in which, you know, you're operating within the paradigm in which you were born. And so you're going to continue to pass down those kind of traditions. Um, and I, you know, I say that this leads to an aesthetic of consensus through the workshop process. Because there are some assumptions even have have a workshop, that there's an authority as to what's good. Um, my friend Paul White used to say that uh, there's two principles in the MFA school, that a poem be good and clear. Uh, and those sound simple, but that's really what it boils down to. And, and we could break those down for a half hour. I won't do that here. But the idea that we know what a good poem is, you know, by reading it and discussing it, and that we're all going to agree on it, and the fact that if it's not clear, then we can't know for sure if it's good. Um, well, 
Um, a lot of those friends, we used to, uh, my poetry family, Jennifer White, Paul White, Cy, and there were many others, uh, Chris Wong, Jacob, Travis Largent. Uh, we used to sit in my kitchen and look at this uh, picture I got from the Ice Cream Social uh, in Fayetteville. And it was like a poster board version of Picasso's Blue Nude with a handmade frame. And we would sit there and stare at it and, and look at everything that wasn't blue. And, um, and, and one day we noticed or decided, or at least I did, I don't know if they agree, that the most important thing on that painting is the name Picasso, which is my dog's middle name, by the way, Copper Picasso. I wish I had a picture of him. Um, because when we see it's Picasso, then we already decided it's good and we're going to figure out why. This is especially true in the MFA school. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of you have heard of Emily Dickinson, and I'm sure a lot of you know her story, that she, uh, you know, she only sent out a few poems during her life. And she used to send uh, poems to an editor. Um, <clears throat> and she was so, so unconventional, and her poems were ungrammatical, and her, her, her punctuation was idiosyncratic that he told her she shouldn't publish because she wouldn't be accepted. She was too different. And what she chose, uh, she wasn't in the MFA school, and she chose to write her poems in secret rather than to put them out there and be influenced by that kind of overarching aesthetic. And so when she died, um, there were you know a few thousand poems that she had in her drawer and what were called fascicles, where she had handwritten them in beautiful cursive, and they were stitched together in little thematic books or packets. And when her sister and that same editor went to publish them, they edited them to make them fit the times. And thankfully, people came back later and said, no, these are genius. They're brilliant. And so when we read an Emily Dickinson, and we see that kind of unconventional grammar or punctuation, Instead of assuming the person has made a mistake like we would in a beginning writing workshop or in a comp one class, we figure out where we're wrong. Like, what am I missing? I, and uh, I want to talk about my creative writing experience at UAB because I had a great one. Um, um, Tony Crunk uh, was my mentor and uh, he taught me everything about poetry and I'll be forever grateful. I hope he's listening. Um, <clears throat> in one of our workshops, I made this case. Um, I would hate to have me as my own student, I tell you that. Um, but I made the case that in these popular journals, the mainstream journals, that most of the poetry was God awful. I didn't like any of it. And I said that the only reason it's in there is because of the person's name. And it's kind of a curse. Once you win a prize or you know get a famous book out, you can never really know from this uh, parameter uh, whether your poetry is really good or not because people are going to publish it. Another great influence on me was uh, Linda Frost, who was the editor of PMS, Poem Memoir Story, and that's Linda's uh, sense of humor, to name it PMS. <clears throat> and I was a, a publishing intern with her um, on, I believe, the second edition, and I was the only male on that staff and sitting around in her house and discussing the merits of the poems uh, was one of my greatest poetry experiences. And one day, I hope she doesn't mind me telling this, I don't think she would. But one day when we got to her office, she got a poem from Ruth Stone and she was overjoyed and she turned to me and before uh, she opened the envelope, she said, we're gonna publish this. And, and I have to say, I kind of judged her on that. And I don't remember if I told her or not. And I thought myself above that. Um, and I know why. is because if that name is on the magazine, then people are going to get the magazine. And more people are going to read the unknown names within that magazine. And I uh, fell into the same thing with this magazine. I had written to Amiri Baraka. Um, and, you know, he had his thing happen with Somebody Blew Up America. If you don't know about that, we'll have to save it for another talk but they tried to get rid of him as the New Jersey Poet Laureate. <laughs> and I wrote to Christopher Funkhauser, who was his website uh, engineer at that time. And I wrote Baraka a letter just as I did to Ed Sanders saying, 
you guys are some of the only American poets that are doing anything that matters, that is, that is a risk, where it could cost you something, where you stand to lose something. And that's how I created this magazine is for that. And uh, two weeks later, Funkhauser sent me a note that says, you got lucky, Baraka sent this for you. And then Baraka just said, let me know, AB. I was like, I'll let you know. And so I went back to my co-editor, my first wife, Lisa, who was the co-creator of the magazine. And I said, we're publishing this. <laughs> and, and just like Linda did. And I was doing it for the same reasons, but I'd read the poem. And just like I said, you know it or you don't. And I knew it was good. I didn't need to break it down and analyze it. And Lisa has a very analytical mind. And she said, I want to know how it works. And I respect that. And that's why we were good editing partners. And so she went through and did an annotated version, which is amazing uh, itself, and, and saw that it was true in the sense. You'll see what I mean by that if, if we have time as we keep going. It's true like a board is true, you know, straight. And so we loved it so much, we put it in a centerfold. Um, and before Baraka died, I wrote to him and asked him if I could put it on my website. And, and he said yes. And that's the only place I think this poem is available. So um, it's out there somewhere. If anybody wants access to it, drop me a note and I'll, I'll make sure it's available. I don't have time to read that poem right now. But at that AWP in 2007, when the magazine was launched, we sat in the circle in the middle of all these people passing out business cards. And we did a group reading going around the circle of that poem and a lot of other things like that. Uh, like I said, to make a spectacle of ourselves so that poetry could get the attention rather than uh, the poetry business. Okay, um, since it's eight o'clock already, Sarah, you were right. Um, I was worried I wasn't going to fill it all. And uh, she said, you'll probably run out of time. So uh, I want to transition to another poem, which is um, the poem that won me over for poetry. I'm going to put it up on this. Well, yeah, okay, I'll go ahead and put it up. Um, and it's the language of the brag by Sharon Knowles. Oh, actually, I forgot I have a video to use. Um, and just to, to finish this little train real quick. Um, so I was working as an electronics technician for my parents. Um, and Lisa was in school at night studying poetry. And I worked all day. And then I would come home and keep our son, Jeremy, who's 30, be 31 this year and has uh, four children of his own. Um, and, and I would say, I was griping, you know, why am I working all day and having to keep the kid so you can go study poetry? What's the point? You know, you're not gonna make any money at it. I don't even see any use for poetry. And also we had just had a child. We bought a house, you know, American dream, right? And, and I was like, why are you unhappy? You know, and I had no idea what she was going through. And keep in mind, I was not open to poetry at all. And she gave me a stack of books by women poets with poems marked in each one. The only other poet I remember that was in there was Tess Gallagher. Um, now, I probably can't read this poem because even talking about it, I get choked up. Once a poem gets you, it's got you. Uh, and this one got me. And so against all that resistance and all that hatred of poetry, really fear of poetry, this poem, I just read it one time. And it opened me and I saw that plight of her and the other women, you know, with this great American achievement. And I didn't have to study. And, and sure, there are some layers of meaning in there that I understand now, but I didn't need to know any of it. And if a poem works, it works. So I was planning on getting to this poem tonight. And I love this PBS poetry series, Poetry in America. If you haven't watched it, check it out. It's in the third season. And it's this great show where they bring in a poet and like a musician and a politician or three or four random people discuss a poem and break it down and you get the history of the poets great. And so I went to that show to kind of play it as an introduction to the poem before I got started. And I'm going to put that on right now. I have wanted excellence in the knife throw. 
I have wanted to use my exceptionally strong and accurate arms and my straight posture and quick electric muscles to achieve something at the center of a crowd. Blade piercing the bark deep. The haft slowly and heavily vibrating like the... Say what? Oh, Chris, be sure to unmute. Okay. Uh, when I got to that poem in the in the show, I was floored um, that they blurred that word out, the word cock, and that and the word feces. And not only they censored the person speaking it, and then they went on to discuss why she had chosen to use uh, taboo words to show the constraints that are put on. Uh, women writers, and then they're putting the same constraints on it in the same breath. And I, I know somebody at PBS made that decision. Um, so, you know, we're going to read the poem uncensored because one of those seven ways of seeing is emotion. And if, if you censor out all the words that make you feel icky or tingly, then you're censoring out the emotion. And, and that's a lot of what happens in a kind of workshop process. And this poem is, uh, let me get back to it. Um, I couldn't get it to depict the whole thing at once. So it's gonna be hard to read along. If you have a copy at home, or you can probably pull up a copy, I'll give you a few seconds and you can pull it up and that way you can see the whole thing and read along. <clears throat> and this uh, poem deals with the epic tradition as well. First, I just wanna read it and then we'll look at a few things in it. Um, and then we can um, have a discussion if y'all have any questions or I, I can say more. I can always say more about poetry. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, the language of the brag. I have wanted excellence in the knife throw. I've wanted to use my exceptionally strong and accurate arms and my straight posture and quick electric muscles to achieve something at the center of a crowd. The blade piercing the bark deep, the haft slowly and heavily vibrating like the cock. I've wanted some epic use for my excellent body, some heroism, some American achievement beyond the ordinary for my extraordinary self. Magnetic and tensile, I have stood by the sand lot and watched the boys play. I have wanted courage. I have thought about fire and the crossing of waterfalls. I have dragged around my belly big with cowardice and safety. My stool black with iron pills, my huge breasts oozing mucus, my legs swelling, my hands swelling, my face swelling and darkening, my hair falling out my inner sex stabbed again and again with terrible pain like a knife. I have lain down. I have lain down and sweated and shaken and passed blood and feces and water and slowly alone in the center of a circle, I have passed the new person out. And they have lifted the new person free of that act and wiped the new person free of that language of blood like praise all over the body. I have done what you wanted to do, Walt Whitman, Allen Ginsberg. I have done this thing, I and the other women, this exceptional act with the exceptional heroic body, this giving birth, this glistening verb, and I am putting my proud American boast right here with the others. Whew, I did it. I got through it without breaking down and crying. Okay. Since uh, she did bring up, a lot of people wonder why did she pick Walt Whitman and Allen Ginsberg right there? And I, I think it's because in writing this poem and her nature all together, and I remember she said at one point when she finished, I think it was Columbia, and she stood out on the steps and said, now I know I have to forget everything I just learned. And, and she was a rebel poet to write this, you know, or an outlaw poet. 
and they were outlaw poets. And I mean, both of those men could be considered feminists, I think. So I don't think she was talking to them, but I think she was saying, I'm an outlaw too. And I've done this thing that you wanted to do, but I've got something you can't do. I can make my own people and I can make a poem. And that's the proud American boast because it's a struggle for women writers in a male dominated editorial system. I don't know if you've ever heard of Vita. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, God, I hope I didn't mess that up. But they do a count every year of the number of women that are published in journals. And, um, you know, who are the editors? How many were submitted? And it hasn't really gone up that much. And I have to say, even myself, I'm, you know, a feminist. I'm woman conscience. As you can see, I've picked mostly women for this show. But when I looked back at one point over the history of everybody I published, it largely was dominated by men. And, and this is a, you know, a constant battle. Um, and I want to just put up real quick, since we mentioned uh, Walt Whitman, a kind of famous quote from him. Um, and, uh, and I see this um, on people's refrigerators and stuff. Um, and this is from the preface uh, to the original, the, 80, um, the 80, 1855 edition of Leaves of Grass, which is a wonderful prose piece. And you can get it online. It's long. You know, if you teach a class on poetry, teach it or read it if you haven't. And he uh, clearly and in depth articulates the role of the poet as it was and the role of the poet as it is and it shall be. And it's wonderful. And I'll read this, but the main thing that I want to take from it is that I'll read it first. He says, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, I thought Greg was texting me something. Okay, he says, this is what you shall do. Love the earth and sun and the animals. Despise riches. Give alms to everyone that asks. Stand up for the stupid and crazy. Devote your income and labor to others. Hate tyrants. Argue not concerning God. Have patience and indulgence toward the people. Take off your hat to nothing, known or unknown, or to any man or number of men. Go freely with powerful, uneducated persons and with the young, with the mothers of families. Read these leaves in the open air every season of every year of your life. Re-examine all you've been told at school or church or in any book. Dismiss whatever insults your own soul and your very flesh shall be a great poem and have the richest fluency, not only in its words, but in the silent lines of its lips and face and between the lashes of your eyes and in every motion and joint of your body. And when, when uh, Walt Whitman um, self-published his book uh, and it came out, and pretty much everybody hated it. For one, it wasn't, it wasn't rhymed and it was in what we call free verse, verse libra, verse liberated. Um, and, and that was a new thing. Thank you, Walt Whitman. Because yes, Socrates was right in some sense, um, we can't remember all these poems anymore. You know, they're not written in meter and rhyme a lot of times. And honestly, in a class or in, when I'm editing, if I come across a poem that's in verse and rhyme, I say, hey, a song. And that's what I call those poems. I mean, they're poems, but they're songs. And, uh, and this, with this, yes, we can't remember the poems, um, but that's why it's, we have books and computers and iPhones. We don't have to remember them anymore. So let that shit go, pardon my French. Um, and that's why when we go stand on a milk crate and make a spectacle of ourselves, the poem becomes a song again and it can do its job to pass on those traditions, that culture. And all I wanna do is for someone to come up and ask me, you know, what is that? And I've got them, that's all I wanna do. All right, I can say more. We've got about uh, 20 minutes left, but Greg, I don't know how we can get any questions. Uh, I've got a few more things I can say if there aren't any. 
give me some guidance. Yeah, go ahead and, and continue. I've got a few written down. And if, if people in the audience have questions for Chris, go ahead and drop them in the chat. We'll let them go on for another five, 10 minutes, and then we'll, we'll skip over to the questions. But very, very interesting how people view poetry and, and how powerful it can be. And as Lisa said, it can be forceful. So with that, I'll, I'll give it back to you and, and take us through more of this journey. Okay. I'd like to, uh, there is one thing that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, so at the time that um, I did this magazine, I, I didn't have the money. Back with these types of magazines on a web press, like that prints a newspaper, it's very expensive. And you can't just order a few copies. And so we ordered 5,000 copies um, and it cost a few thousand dollars. And I remember my friend Paul, because at that time, um, online poetry magazines were kind of just getting started. And it was like, ah, the true democracy of poetry, right? You don't need any money to publish it and it can instant access for everybody. But for some reason, and Paul said, why are you doing a print magazine? And I've thought about that a lot. I did then, and I'm sure I answered. I don't remember what I said, um, but I know uh, what I would say now. Um, and I know why I did it now um, is because um, a magazine or a print journal um, can decay and, and it can die. And so it's alive, like a bottle of wine. Um, and if something can't decay and die, then it was never alive in the first place. I remember a, a, a friend of mine, Jacob, we wrote this. I do these online collaborations called Poet Juice. And I got that from my friend Paul also, where I call a line by line. And it could be two poets or several poets. You can see some examples at uh, USPOCO.com, USPOCO.com. That's our main website. And also... Uh, I'll put my, Greg, if you can remind me to put my email out there before we're done. <coughs> um, totally lost my train of thought there. Uh, but we, we do these line by lines and give ourselves over to the process. Um, totally lost that train. So give me one of those questions, Greg. You bet. So one thing that you know kind of popped into my my head and you know how much of poetry and what can be felt through a poem is contingent upon the delivery well i think that um uh, if it's a if it's a tuned in poem that's okay and that's a good if i forget that question remind me because i'm i'm losing my brain power here at the end <laughs> which I just did. Tell me that question again. <laughs> sure. So how much of poetry and what can be felt through a poem? Okay, thank you. Is contingent on the delivery of the person reading it. Right. Um, so the seven ways of seeing, it's not like you can sit down and go, okay, I'm going to get some psychological, some emotional in here. So what good is that? Um, Charles Bukowski has on his grave, don't try. And I've always liked that, but I didn't really understand it. And if I have a mind to write a poem and I have an idea of a poem, then I'm trying to do a specific thing before I ever sit down. But as a poet, what I do is practice. I read poetry. I study the craft. And when I sit down to write, I just want to sit down and write a poem that's honest, fundamentally honest. And as my uh, teacher at University of Arkansas, Molly Giles, my fiction teacher used to say, Write the story only you can write. So if I sit down to write the poem only I can write and don't filter it, then I believe I'm tapping into as many of those seven appeals of poetry uh, that I can. And, and if that poem is truly tapped in, like the language of the brag, for instance, then a poor delivery uh, is not going to limit it so much. Um, its power will still get through. But it'll suck for the audience, you know. I have an I owe something to the audience to do a good job performing it. And so the way I do that is to practice and to read poetry out loud all the time. 
So everybody who takes poetry serious and, and writes an honest poem is going to be nervous reading it. I started in the Poetry Slam, and I didn't bring that up. But um, the Poetry Slam movement, which was started by a construction worker in the 80s, kind of arose alongside the MFA school paradigm as the counterculture. And even back in the um, epic days, you know, there was popular poetry and court poetry. And as I traveled around in each little town, I sought out to see how many poetry communities there were. And there were always these kind of competing um, realms of poetry. And I started uh, in the slam movement um, in Birmingham, Alabama in the mid to late 90s, which was awesome, by the way. And then I went into and became, you know, studied poetry, became an academic poet. Some of my colleagues don't don't think the slam movement is valid um, because it, it's, it's based on oral performance. You have three minutes and most of those poets memorize their poems. And it's great, a great delivery. A lot of those poems don't need to appear a certain way on a page. Um, and so in that sense, there's, there's power in that, in that kind of transmission of a poem. And I, I think if those two kind of the counterculture and the ruling culture um, could come together. Um, and I believe, and I'm not saying Amanda Gorman is a slam poet, but she's in that milieu of that type of delivery that she does and the way that she writes. And I think in her, and she's probably sold more books than anybody at this point. I don't know, I haven't looked it up, but I think in her, those two schools are coming together. That's just a feeling, it's my thought. Did I answer your question, Greg? Yeah, no, that was very good. I've um, got another question. In your opinion, is there a legitimate place for an unshared poem? And let me give you a little background on this. At some point, this person says the poem will be shared, but not quite yet. They had a six-year-old son who uttered something so powerful while they were driving them to school. They had to pull, pull the car off onto the shoulder, and they couldn't breathe and drive at the same time. That person now is 41 years old, so 35 years later. They're still not ready to share. So going back to the original question, in your opinion, is there a legitimate place for an unshared poem? I'm sure there is. There was for Emily Dickinson, but you might not know it in your lifetime, right? Because uh, we didn't find those poems until she died. Uh, so I'm sure there is a legitimate place for an unshared poem. But why? Why not share it? You know, why do you write these poems and put them in your desk drawer like the busboy poet? Um, and the slam movement, Craig Legg uh, was one of, and Hunter Bell, um, they were kind of my poetry uh, mentors. And I was just, you know, I was so nervous when I read my poems that I literally was shaking. And I'm sure a lot of you newer poets do that. Yes, it's because it's important and it's true. Don't just, just, power right through that shaking. We all do it. You know, I was terrified. And then I remember I took my first uh, road trip out West, um, my first um, Hodge to the West Coast out of probably a dozen now. And I, when I discovered poetry, I didn't know, and I discovered Allen Ginsberg, I didn't know if he was still alive or dead. And then I found out he was alive. And so Lisa and I had planned to go through Boulder a uh, conference with the Dalai Lama on compassion and we booked a hotel and I was going to meet Ginsburg and he literally died like the month before and we still went and uh, they had made a memorial that was a kind of art thing hanging from a tree and I stood there in a silent moment and that was my meeting uh, with him and so those guys when I came back they said because uh, you know I wasn't really sending out my poems and they said, you have to. Now I don't subscribe to this now, but I needed that then. Um, they said, if you're not sending out your poems, then you're not doing it. You know, uh, wallpaper your wall rejection slips. That's how you know you're a poet because that's part of the process, you know, and it's not failure because who's to say, you know, whoever edits a magazine, whoever runs the workshop or whoever runs the creative writing program, it's their aesthetic that's that's dominant. It doesn't mean they're right. And when I did this first magazine and I started my first open submission, 
and I was getting poems from all over the country, all famous people, people that had a bio list of all these publications and the poems were awful. It really hurt my heart about poetry, you know? Um, so send your poetry out there, be bad with all the rest of us, you know, uh, make it a bad that's not to be believed, but at least you're still alive. And you don't know what's embedded in that poem that is the message that you're projecting. If I write a poem now and it's got one good, clean, spare line, I'll take it. Yeah, th this person says that they're that the poem was too precious and they're selfish, so they're kind of keeping it to themselves. That's why they don't share. So another question for you. You like beats, and apparently you like to sometimes read Ginsburg from your milk carton, this person says. They've heard you do it. So what is it about the physicality, the kinetics of the okay. beats that move you? Well, I'll just focus on Ginsburg because I'll start talking forever. We only have eight minutes left. Um, so Ginsburg's Howl um, is the most fun to read, you know, and that um, Ginsburg's dad was a poet, uh, Louis Ginsburg, and he taught, and he was a minor poet, well known. And, and Ginsburg, Allen Ginsburg, was a young kid uh, writing in his shadow. In the first few years of his writing, he was writing kind of bad imitative poetry. And then he sat at a cafeteria and decided he was just going to tell the truth, like what I'm talking about, you know, like the seven ways of seeing I'm talking about. And he decided he wasn't going to show it to anybody. And that's what gave him the freedom. And he just wrote it and it came out as this kind of depiction of the horror of what um, the underside of America was like. And, and it was a poem when he finally read it, it changed the world. It changed poetry forever. And that poem, because he sat down and tuned in, I like to use the cable car metaphor. It's a kind of mysticism, maybe. You know how the cable car works. I was amazed when I learned this in San Francisco. The cable is constantly running under the ground. Did you know that? And what they do is they put the clamp down and clamp on. And the cable pulls you along. And that's what you do with this. You know, once you put that clamp on, you're in those seven ways of seeing. That's all you have to do is find out how to not try. Quit trying to do something and just pour it out there as honestly as possible. And for whatever reason, when I read that poem, I am transformed. And I do it. Um, I've done it in my local town down at the square. I've done it on Valentine's Day. And, and you wouldn't believe the passersby. It's always the, if it's a couple, the woman is interested in it. And the guy's like, keep on going. He's just like I was back then. Like, screw that poetry stuff. I have no cause for that. The last time I did it was on Valentine's Day. And like I said, you never know who's there to hear it. And But when I'm up there, I read the whole thing, all four parts. It's really long. It takes like, it took me like 40 minutes to read it. Um, and when I was done, I had noticed this person in my periphery sitting down and she's a girl who more or less lives in the park there. And uh, she had like pink hair and stuff, but I couldn't ever look over at her. But the fact that I knew she was listening gave me the strength to push through that whole poem. And when I climbed down on the milk crate, I sat down next to her and I started to say, what do you, what did you think? And she said, are you an angel? And I said, I don't know, because I don't know what she needed to hear out of that. But I was happy I was there, and I'm going to keep doing it. So the last question I have for you before we wrap up um, is personal in nature, at least to you. What defines you as a poet? Well, I'm not defined as a poet anymore. Um, to start my publishing company, I had to publish my first book, and that had a huge cost. Um, you know, Lawrence Ferlinghetti published his book to start City Lights. Whitman published his book. And I still believe in the book. It hasn't found its audience yet. But I'm not defined by my need for credentials or recognition, you know, and then they finally got recognized. So they left in obscurity and misery. I don't need that. But what I see myself as is a poetry advocate and I'm a human being advocate and poetry is a power that people are denying themselves. And so I was saved from that by a poem. And so I'm going to keep putting that out there and try to bring other people along. 
that's that's defines me and that's my role and that's what drives me you know that's that's who i am for poetry chris fascinating presentation uh, great information throughout the evening and thank you so much for donating 90 minutes of your time back to uab and uh spending this with us this evening thank you so much thank you so much and let's do it live soon and get a get a, a real audience for me a live audience we're getting to that point thank you again so a reminder to everybody a recording of tonight's webinar will be available online starting tomorrow and be sure to join us for other upcoming webinars next tuesday april 12th to learn what your diet should look like in order to protect and maintain your cognitive function while reducing your stroke risk. Dr. Suzanne Judd, director of the Lister Hill Center for Health Policy will be our featured guest during diet and brain health. On Thursday, May 19th, take part in comedy, just say yes. During this webinar, we'll find out how we can develop your, our own happiness plan and learn why humor helps cope with stress with Dr. Kevin Fontaine, professor and chair for the School of Public Health. On Tuesday, June 7th, be part of No Nonsense Nutrition, Balanced Eating Without Breaking Your Budget. Riley Thorne, a registered dietitian and nutritionist here at UAB, will join us to figure out ways to eat better while getting over that sticker shock at the grocery store. I think we all need that right now. And on Tuesday, July 12th, we welcome Donald, uh, Dr. Ronald Laser for Save Your Brain, Do the Dirty Dozen Today for a Healthy Brain Tomorrow. During this virtual event, we'll explore modifying lifestyle behaviors, habits, and conditions that impact our brains and what we can do now to benefit our future. Register for those and others online at alumni.uab.edu slash events. Blaze your way with our 16th annual scholarship run presented by Viva Health. This year's run will be held Friday, April 22nd through Sunday, April 24th. It's your run, so support student scholarships by running wherever you would like. Registration is only 35 bucks. Not only do you support students, you get a race t-shirt and finisher's medal. Find out more, including how to register at alumni.uab.edu slash 5K 10K. We'll be giving back to the UAB community this Saturday, April 9th. Join us as we volunteer on various indoor and outdoor projects at Glen Iris Elementary here in Birmingham. Registration is free and we will begin at 8 a.m. And if you're thinking about going to the spring game that day, no worries, we'll be done at noon. And we're also providing breakfast and lunch. Go to our website, alumni.edu slash Unite Day. And let us help get you through your day or your commute. Listen into the UAB Green Until podcast. We have new episodes released every other week. Download the podcast on Spotify and the Apple Podcast app. And be sure to stay on top of all things alumni on social media. You can look us up by searching UAB alumni on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On LinkedIn, search alumni career community. As we close tonight, be sure to give us feedback. The QR code on your screen will send you to a short survey, and I do mean short. I'll leave the slide up for a few moments so you have a chance to provide us with your feedback. Once again, thank you to tonight's guest, Chris Pappas. Thank you all for joining us, and as always, go Blazers. <laughs>